We are finishing up this morning a uh, four-part series on unity, building it and rebuilding it once it's been lost. Let's, let's pray together and let's ask God to meet with us while we open his word. Father in heaven, that is what we want above all things, is we want you to meet with us um, as we come to you in your word. And we pray that uh, you would make our hearts soft and teachable, or I pray that any scales on our eyes would fall off and we would be able to see more clearly who you are and that we would understand with clarity um, the intent of your word as we look at it this morning. Thank you for this Bible that you've given to us. Thank you for how clear it is in your mind, how clear it is for you to speak and for the intent of your words to come forth. Lord, we know that all of the lack of clarity is on our side. We pray that this morning you would draw near and overcome our lack of clarity and that you would be merciful to us. And Father, in regards just to this whole topic of unity, Lord, we, we pray for it um, amongst ourselves. We pray first just for the Cans and the Mitchells who are finally back together in Medang. And Lord, with so many decisions in front of them, I'm sure it will at points test their unity. And I pray, Father, that they would build wisely and rebuild their unity once conflict arises. I pray for my friend Massimo and his teammate Matt in Italy, Lord, that as they continue to labor on in Genoa to bring the gospel to a country that left the gospel so, so long ago and is entrenched in their supposed good works. Father, I pray that you would give them unity of heart and mind as they labor for the gospel for your son's sake. And Lord, for every ministry team that's a part of Grace Bible Church and in Grace Bible Church, Lord, I pray for us as well that we will preserve this unity. It's ours in the spirit. It's a bond of peace that you have given to us. You achieved it through your son's death at the cross. Lord, would you please help us to be wise, to love unity, to guard it, to rebuild it once it's been lost. Draw near to us now, Lord. Meet with us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The formation of this amazing book of God's words was never in the hands of bumbling man to form, to put together. But, but its formation was only ever under the flawless control of the God who spoke these words. And he owns these as his own. He knew how he wanted to start this book of his words. He knew how he wanted to end this book of his words. And he knew how to just unfold the right sequence of these words one page after another. A flawless mind, an unthwartable mind, didn't waste a word anywhere. He didn't overspeak and just kind of keep running on at the mouth and you kind of just have to skip over those words. And he never said two less. Every word of God is tested. How could you favor one section of it over another? It is all stunning. It is all captivating, every page. And every page is eternally significant for your soul and for my soul. We should alert ourselves to how he ends this book that he put together. And we should sit up and take note how it unfolds from one book to the next book, from one section to the next section, from one testament to the next testament. And we should look carefully at how it begins. When you open this book of his words, what does God want you to come face to face with first? What is the first impression he makes on everyone who reads page one? A famous American author said, two things are irretrievable in life, time and first impressions. 
You, you can't get either of them back. God doesn't need to get back his first impression he made here, guys. What does God want on your mind on page one as you then progress into all of his other words that follow in this book? Famous American actor said, you never get a second chance at a first impression. And God doesn't need a second chance on page one. What greets you at the doorway of the Bible? What does God present to you that is absolutely undeniable? What does he lay out before you on page one that is unavoidable? What is undoubtable on page one? What is unforgettable as you open this book? Well, let's take a look at it together. Would you turn to Genesis chapter one with me? And let's take a look at some very familiar words. Some very familiar words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and the void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then watch this. Day one. Then God said. Verse three. And there it was, light. And God saw that the light was good, verse four. And, and so God separated the light from the darkness. One of the very first things that God presents about himself is that he is a speaking God. That's what he wants you to come up with first in his word. Just his words are on display. They are powerful words. He spoke and it was, light was. It was just there. These are amazing words that he speaks, and God assessed the result of what his powerful words created, and he categorized the result as good. And then he acted in alignment with his words, not in contradiction to his words. God separated the light from the darkness. He was pleased to act in accordance with what his powerful words just stated and created. His words were clear to him. He understood what he said, and he acted in alignment with his words. Day two, look at verse six. Then God said, dot, 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 verse seven. So God made, and it was so. Notice there's no one else to hear the speaking God except his triune self. Powerful words are being spoken again. He again acted in accordance with what he spoke. He honors his spoken word. It is a respectable word that should have actions brought into alignment with their intent. His words are to be honored. There's no intertrinitarian doubt about what he's saying. There's no intertrinitarian questioning about what was said. There's no intertrinitarian disagreement about his words. He didn't speak one thing and then do something different. Just a perfect intent and an absolutely effortless outcome. No resistance to his words anywhere. No opposition to them. Look at the first part of day three. Verse nine, then God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good. Again, powerful and effective words. No training wheels are needed on these words. They just do fine on their own. God said, and it was so, every single time. And the outcome of God's words was assessed by him once again as good. There's nothing unfortunate that results when he speaks. There's nothing disappointing that follows in the wake of these words when he speaks. Listen, write it down. Good things happen when this God speaks. That's page one. Good things happen when this God speaks. And this is what God wants you to come face to face with when you enter into his book of his words. Look at the last part of day three, verse 11. 
Then God said, dot, 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 and it was so. And God saw that it was good. Have you noticed that the speaking God isn't weary of making the same point about his words over and over? His words have great power day after day, and the exact intention of his words comes to pass every single time. He again acts in alignment with his word. He assesses the outcome of his words, and he categorizes it as good. He's not growing weary of stating it and then restating it and then restating it. I wonder what could come on page or on day four. Look at verse 14. Then God said, verse 15, and it was so. So God made, verse 16, and God placed them, verse 17, and God saw that it was good. Again, just more of the same. He does not grow weary of telling us again that this is just how his words are. There's a beat that he's setting on the first page. There's a note that he keeps striking over and over, and he wants to tune his readers on page one to that note, and he wants them to read to that beat. His word is powerful. He acts in alignment with his word. It is a respectable word to honor in his eyes. He is not hesitant to put his creative action in alignment with that word. He is not a God who speaks one thing and then regrets what he says. He is not ashamed of what he said. His words are never thwarted when he speaks. The result of them is always in the category of good. There is never a mixed bag of results from his word. Good things happen when and where this God speaks. That's the beat he's striking on page one. That's the note he keeps playing. Day five, verse 20. Then God said, verse 21, and God created, and God saw that it was good. The same note, the same beat, continue to be struck. This is not growing old in his view, revealing the same thing over and over about his powerful word. It's almost like he's trying to make He's in alignment with his word. The good result that comes from the, his powerful words is it's no problem for him to just say it over and over and over. But now there's a significant addition. Look at verse 22. Then God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, fill, multiply all over the surface of the earth. God blessed the good outcome of his word. It was already good. But now, even beyond that goodness, he has creatures who are there and they must be beneficiaries of his good result from his word. And he wants them to flourish in life in that goodness. Get this, here's what God will not accept. God will not speak powerful words. He won't align himself with those words and honor them. He won't declare the result good, but then allow any one of his creatures in that goodness to experience barrenness of life or deprivation in life. That would be incongruent with his intent, with his nature, with his words that he has spoken. It wouldn't fit. Of course, what is fitting for the good outcome of his words is creatures flourishing with life there. He speaks, and even gooder things come to pass and are expected by him. Look at the first part of day six, verse 24. Then God said, and it was so. God made, verse 25, and God saw that it was good. Again, page one, the same thing over and over. Are you getting tired of hearing it yet? Because he's not tired of saying it. He's still not growing weary of striking that same note and hitting that same beat. There is still no resistance anywhere to his powerful words. There is still never a questionable outcome from his words. There has not been a mixed bag of results anywhere from his words. He never assesses the outcome of his spoken word as bad or not as good. What a world is coming into shape under the words of this God who speaks 
page one. He is just very happy to speak and let his word go forth in power. He honors it by acting in alignment with it. He declares the outcome good, and he wants his creatures to flourish in life where his words have been spoken. The last half of day six, look at verse 26. Then God said. Verse 27, and God created man. He created him, male and female. He created them. Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. Verse 29, then God said, behold, I have given to you every green plant on the surface of all the earth. He's not holding anything back. Every tree which has fruit, it shall be food for you. We'll get the clarification in chapter two in just a minute. I have given every green plant for food to every beast and creeping thing. Verse 30, and it was so. Verse 31, and God saw all that he had made. And behold, it wasn't just good, it was very good. Perhaps another observation at this point, the only one acting in connection with his words is God himself. In other words, he did not speak and then employ his angels to go and do any of the creating work alongside him. Page one is all about God. Page one is all about his words. Page one is all about God and his words being on center stage. That is what he wants you to see first as you come through the door of his word into the rest of his words. That is the first impression he wants to make. He doesn't need to retrieve it and get a second chance at it. He nailed it. And again, good things happen when this God speaks, but on top of that, as if that wasn't enough, he wants blessing on day six. He wants creature flourishing in life um, to follow in the wake of the good results of his words. No creature should experience any kind of barrenness of life or deprivation of life where His words have been active, and man has a special place of privilege in the good results of his words. You see, man is in his image. Man is to image forth to creation the God who is speaking and the God who is acting in alignment with his words, the God who is good. God put his image no other place in his creation except right there in man. And again, whatever God spoke, it was so. No variations, no mixed results coming. And the final result of all of his words is very good. There weren't some bad days along with some good days. They were all good. And it was all very good at the end. I tell you, the first part of your Bible, as you walk into the Bible, um, man and God's creatures um, should live abundantly where God speaks. Because when God speaks, good things result, and then he only wants the flourishing of life to exist there in that goodness. Where he speaks, he doesn't want any deprivation, no barrenness of life, no struggling to live, no doubts about whether or not they're going to live, no anxieties about how are they going to live, no threats to life anywhere. Life and life abundantly is found under his words that he speaks Life and life abundantly is found where God has spoken. And that is what God wants you to come face to face with on page one. That is the irretrievable first impression he makes on those who read his book. You must face this about him if you are going to venture into then all of the rest of these words. Now let's get a little clarification and go into Genesis chapter two. Let's drop down into the details of day six. Look at chapter two, verse 16. And Yahweh God commanded the man saying, from any tree you may surely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from it. In the day, you know, like, evening and then morning, day one. In the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. 
you will surely know. This is not the first time that God has uttered a command, but it is emphasized here that these words to man were definitely in a command form. So there is an intensification of the description of God's speech. And so the reader should sit up and take notice. Something important here is at stake. Notice this. God wants man to benefit from his good provision of food. It can be found everywhere. But he reveals that his words made a boundary line that was to not be crossed. And right there in verse 17 comes this jarring thought that God would speak his words and someone would actually not act in accordance with them. How anti-God would that be? That would be shocking. God has only put himself forward every day prior as an example of what to do after he speaks. You act in alignment with those words. You act in accordance with those words. You respect those words. You honor those words. That's what God's been doing with his own words. And then beyond that, there's this jarring thought. Verse 17, death. Could they even know what that meant? Because The consistent, dependable outcome of God's words every single time was only good. And in the good result, God blessed and he wanted flourishing of life to be experienced. So on the obedience side of the line of God's words, no man, no creature was to to experience any kind of barrenness of life, no deprivation of life of any kind, no doubts about life, no anxieties about life, no struggles with life, no threats to life. Just blessing of life and flourishing of life in God's good outcome of his words. That's on the obedience side. But on the disobedience side, the dishonoring side of God's words, there is promised the most tragic deprivation of all kinds, the most greatest barrenness ever known, death. And God is sure about this. He's confident in what he is speaking in the day, not sometime later, death will visit you, but no, in the day, you will surely die. Not maybe die, but dying, you will die. The stakes for man are exceedingly high, and they are massively heavy, and all of the attention is on God's words and what man will do with them. What a first impression. What is the first impression God makes in Scripture? I have 10 observations for you this morning. I'm going to give you five up front, and then we will read a little bit more, and I'll give you five more. What must be on your mind as you walk into the rest of Scripture and his words? Number one, this. God is a speaking God. That's what he wants you to conclude. He is a God with words. He is a God of words. He loves to speak words. He's talking a lot. Number two, what is the first impression God makes in Scripture? God has the greatest power united with his words. What didn't exist at all prior to his spoken word immediately comes into existence once he spoke. What can't God's words accomplish? What is the first impression God makes in scripture? Number three, God has the highest honor for his words. What God spoke, he respected and unhesitatingly acted in alignment with over and over every day. He was pleased to do what he said. On page one, the reader is confronted with this. God wants this on your mind first as you pass by the speaking God in Genesis one and two and you venture into the rest of his words. He honors what he has said. What is the first impression God makes in scripture? Number four, God has the highest praise for the result of his words. Over and over, he assessed the result of his words as good. No other categories were offered by him as a viable consideration. The results of his words were never up for debate with anybody. They were never up for vote. When he speaks, only one thing happens. 
good things happen when this God speaks every single time. His words that he spoke were not like a a wobbly child on a bike for the very first time. And God is not some father, nervous father, fretting and running alongside his words, trying to help his words to stay steady. He's not putting a steadying hand on the handlebar of his own words because that would be bad if those words fell to the ground and did not accomplish what he said. And what a world to live in under these words. What a world to live in under these words. Who wouldn't want to live in this world under God's word? And that's page one. What is the first impression God makes in scripture number five? God stakes life and death on obedience to his words. Man's good life was to be found only on that obedience side of God's words. Man's good, his flourishing, his blessing in life was on the obedience side of God's words. And death, deadness to God was on the other side of disobedience to his words. And God every day, only ever offered the example of how to act in alignment with his words. He was the pattern. He was the beat. He was the note being struck. To choose to do anything differently than what God had done with his words would be jarringly anti-God. God staked man's good, and God staked man's death on those words. Everything hinges on these words. Those are your first pages of your Bible. That's amazing. We're just maybe, what, two, three pages in? But you know that we're not done yet because maybe on your next page, definitely in the next chapter, there are more words but these are devastating words. And God also wants his readers to come face to face with the next set of words found in Genesis 3. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh God had made. And watch this. The serpent said, Verse 2, the woman said, and in verse 3, the woman starts talking about what God said. God said, you shall not eat from it, you shall not touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said, just a lot of conversation going on here, there's a lot of words flying around here. The serpent said to the woman, verse 4, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day, in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. It's just a bite away, knowing good and evil. First off, there's, there's just a lot of words flying around. Con- this is a conversation avalanche taking place. And they're just making commentary on what the speaking God said by what the by what he meant what he meant by what he said. It's it's almost like where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. That fits here. It's almost like he who holds back his words has knowledge. That would have been really wise here. It's almost like even an ignorant fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's considered understanding. That would have been really helpful here. It's almost like a fool's lips come with strife, and his mouth calls for beatings. The serpent's mouth needs to be bruised. Someone should come and stomp on his mouth. Fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are the snare of his soul. That rings true. It's almost like 
death and life are in the power of the tongue. That certainly fits here. It's almost like he who keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. That would have been helpful. It's almost like the words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels and they go down into the innermost parts of the stomach. The whispered hissings of the serpent went deep and they did their damage. It's almost like a lying tongue hates those it crushes. That rings true here. It's almost like, do you behold a man or a woman who is hasty in her words? There is more hope for a fool than for her or him. That fits here. Worst of all, both the serpent and Eve are just not unfolding their own thoughts with their own words to one another, but they are freely quoting the speaking God. What he said and what he meant by what he said, contextually, it just seems very careful. And then the serpent's words directly contradicted and assaulted the truthfulness of God's uh, words regarding his words about death. These become rival words to God's. Compare chapter 2, verse 17. In the day you eat from it, you will surely die, said God. Chapter 3, verse 4, you surely will not die. The serpent's words and God's words cannot both be true at the same time. One of them is a lie, and now there's doubt as to which one is true, or so it seems. On the earliest pages of Scripture, God wants his readers to be exposed to this as well. So let's add five more observations. What must be on your mind as you walk through these words into the rest of God's words? Number six, rival words exist and are presented to man. Rival words exist and they are presented to man. The ground of attack that the serpent chose against Eve was the same medium God chose to impress us with words. The serpent spoke to Eve when only God had been the one speaking before to man. In the earliest pages of the Bible, there are words before man that are powerful words. They only result in what is good. The word, these are words that must have a flourishing of life occurring in their wake. And there are now words and ideas before man that are rival words accomplishing just the opposite. That's what God wants you aware of as you make your way into the rest of his words. How well do you know these words? How confident are you in his words for everything that you're going to face in life? I mean, what are they not powerful to accomplish? Because you will find Rival words and rival ideas available at every point in life, at every point in ministry, at every point in your team dynamic for ministry, for the gospel's sake. Are you ever tempted to look elsewhere beyond God's words for, for, an, for another set of ideas, another set of words thinking that maybe, maybe those will be easier. Maybe those will be more helpful. What is the first impression God makes in Scripture number seven? Rival words cast doubt on God's words. Verse one of chapter three, the serpent says, indeed, has God said? What could have been a possible desired effect of a question like that except Doubt. Eve and Adam are now being forced to rethink God's words and their intent. Listen, how do you know when rival words and rival ideas are present before you? Well, when they are present, they are words that get you to rethink the intent of God's words. Do you know that? Do you know that that's the strategy of rival words? Is your antenna set up high enough to pick that up? God wants that impression on you as you venture past chapter three into the rest of his Bible. 
Rival words will get you to doubt God's words. Number eight, what is the first impression God makes in Scripture? Rival words deceptively soften the stakes for man. He says in chapter 3, verse 4, the serpent does, You surely will not die. The only effect the serpent's words could have had would be to cause man to rethink the level of severity of God's consequence for disobedience. They would have wondered, wait a minute, would what God said actually come to pass? Wait, are are you telling me that death might not actually happen? Wait, was God exaggerating? Why would God overstate the consequence? Is disobedience to his words really that dangerous then? And so forth. You see, rival words, when they are present before man, do you know this? Are words that get you to doubt how truly dangerous is disobedience to God's word. Did did God overstate it? In chapter two, in the day you eat it, you will surely die. Did he overstate it? Adam and Eve 8, verse 6 of chapter 3. And just as God said, in that day, they surely died. Listen, they died to him. They died to him that day. They were immediately spiritually dead. You need to understand this, that the first death that God wants you to come face to face with in his word is not physical death. That's coming. But a much more severe death that you need to come to grips with. It's deadness to him. And that spiritual deadness to him was on display in Adam and Eve in the day they ate. Just look down. Spiritual deadness to God expressed itself in the day in that they were overwhelmed by shame. Verse 7 and verse 10, they knew they were naked. They wanted to cover themselves up. Spiritual deadness to God expressed itself in that day in that they didn't want to be found by God. Verse 8, they heard the sound of Yahweh walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God. They didn't want unity with him anymore. They didn't want fellowship with him anymore. They're spiritually dead to him. Spiritual deadness to God expressed itself in that day, in that they had a fear that was driven by disobedience, not worship. I was afraid, he said in verse 10. Spiritual deadness to God expressed itself in that day and that they refused to take responsibility for disobedience. Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to? Look at verse 12. What are the very last words that he finally just lets out at the very end? What does he say at the end? Those aren't his first words. He would not take responsibility. Adam would not take responsibility for what he did. He's spiritually dead to God. It was like the last thing that he could just bring himself to say. And with that, spiritual deadness to God expressed itself in that day by their blame shifting. Did you eat? It's the woman. It's the woman. Eve, did you eat? It's the snake. Spiritually dead to God. It expressed itself in that day and that they ultimately blamed God. Adam did that. It's the woman you gave me. This is on you speaking God. You did this. That spiritual deadness to God is just ugly self protectionism. Let there be no doubt in your mind that God did not overstate the consequence of death in the day. They ate it. Number nine, what is the first impression God makes in scripture? Well, listen, if number seven is true and number eight is true, then that means rival words actually demean God's words. By casting doubt on God's words and then deceptively softening the consequence of disobedience to God's words, God's words lost their respectability, their respectableness. 
They didn't seem like words to esteem quite as highly as before. They didn't seem to be words to take quite as so seriously anymore. The accuracy of God's words all of a sudden seemed unreliable. The measure of them seemed unreliable. What do you, what do you think about the words of someone that you doubt when they speak and who always over-exaggerates? What do you think about their words? Do you respect their words? Do you set their words up high in your mind and esteem them? No, you don't. You actually lower the character of their words. You lower the status of their words, the reputation of their words. The serpent's words had that effect on God's words in Eve's mind. Rival words, when they are present, are you listening? When they are present before you, they are words that get you to lower your respect for God's word. They get you to lower the status and the reputation of God's words in your mind. Rival words get you to think less high of God's words, and it becomes much easier for you to put God's words just on par with other really good ideas, and then you can negotiate away very easily, well, I won't listen to God's word there, but I'll listen to this idea over here. Page one, or, or two or three. And lastly, Number 10, what is the impression God makes in scripture? His first impression, this is the most terrifying one. Rival words were persuasive against sinless man. Number 10, rival words were persuasive against sinless man. Let that sink in. There was no sin nature in Eve And Adam, that was working against them as their rival words were just flying around and as they were conversing about what God said and what he meant by what he said and what their ideas were. There was no sin nature working against them. What then awaits us? who are plagued with indwelling sin still? When rival words and ideas get entertained by us, who are greatly weakened by residual depravity, is there any hope for you and me? That's a first impression. And that is a stunning opening to the Bible. Are you wondering yet what, if any connection this has to do with building and rebuilding unity? Let's make the connection to building and rebuilding unity. Before there were ever rival words or ideas, before they ever arrived on the scene, where only God's powerful word was, where his sure word was, his trustworthy word was, where only good results and where only blessing and flourishing of life existed on that side, unity with God and oneness of flesh between Adam and Eve flourished over there. Flourished. Life abundantly, all together, God with man, man with God, Adam and Eve together. That was at the center of that unity is life and life abundantly together. And after the devastating trespassing across the line into rival words and ideas, the greatest, most devastating fracture of fellowship, the most shocking disintegration of unity occurred between God and man. Man spiritually died to God that day and irreversible, or so it seems, disintegration. Man is now dead to God. He's not flourishing in life anymore. He is not blessed. In fact, God cursed man. And God doesn't curse those that he's in union with. He blesses them. They're not able to enjoy the good result of of God's words as God originally intended them to. Death was abundant. And as Paul says in Romans 5, death is reigning now over man and over God, man's relationship with God. If you're going to walk into the rest of the Bible, this is the entryway you must pass through and think about unity. You have to think about building unity and you have to think about rebuilding it. Do you need to build unity even today in a relationship? The answer is yes, you do. You're either building or you're rebuilding unity. There is only one safe and good set of words 
up for the task. And it's God's word. This is about the sufficiency of God's word to solve your unity problems and your conflict problems. Your unity in Christ with your teammates in gospel ministry can thrive when you set over you and let authoritatively reign over you God's words. Good things happen where his words are, where you live in alignment with God's powerful words. And if your team ever entertains rival words to God's words, listen, separation grows. Separation grows and unity blows apart. It's a self-inflicted wound of the first and worst kind in a team. And Genesis 3, once rival words come on the scene to God's words, God does not say, you know what? Um, I think we can merge some of these ideas together that the serpent has. I, I can work with that. There, he has spoken some level of truth. We can, we can integrate his words into my words. We can build a bridge between these different sets of ideas. God's not doing that at all. There's no need to call to merge other philosophies or ideologies or secular views of man, psychology, so-called wisdom sets. When you're having conflict, do not turn to them. Those ideas will only aggravate your conflict. They will only obstruct biblical unity. Genesis 3 should make that clear to us all. You should have no doubt about that. If you want to, you can write down Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. Listen to Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. This is what God says. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you nor shall you take away from it. Listen, he didn't underspeak and say too little so that you would have to merge other ideas and integrate other truths, so-called, into his. And he also didn't overspeak so much that you could say, well, that's kind of an exaggeration. I don't really know what he's doing there. It seems like God's just kind of running on at the mouth. And so... I, we'll just, I'm, I'm not really going to pay attention to those. No, you shall not add to these words that I'm commanding you. You shouldn't take away from it because so that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh, your God, which I'm commanding you. They are perfect as they are. If you want to obey God's word, you can't add anything to them and you can't take a thing away from them. Every single one is perfect. Write down Proverbs 30 verses five and six. Proverbs 30, 5 and 6, every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words. Don't integrate into his words. Don't merge any other ideas into his words because it says he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. Will you just, I mean, just deal with that. Integrate other ideas from other wisdom sets, so-called wisdom sets in the world, other worldviews into God's, merge them in, and God will prove you to be a liar. Write down Isaiah 55, verses 10 to 11. Isaiah 55, 10 to 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, God says. It will not return to me without accomplishing what pleases me. And it will not return to me without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Listen, God's word can go forth into your unity and God's word can go forth into your conflict that you're experience, experiencing and not return to God empty. It can go into your conflict and it will accomplish what pleases God. It will succeed in the matter for which he sent it into your conflict. You don't need any other words. You don't need any other ideologies. You have everything pertaining to life and godliness and unity and conflict. You got it all. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 20. You can write it down. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 20. Listen to this. 
For the wisdom of this world, see, that's the rival words. That's the rival ideas. The wisdom of the world, of this world, is foolishness before God. Full stop. What does the speaking God of Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and beyond, what does he think of rival words? What does he call them? Foolishness. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. I like this. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that God made. He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. The Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. Listen, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, not that they are easier words and easier ideas and not that they are more intuitive, kind of down to earth kind of words and ideas. No, the Lord knows the reasonings of those that they are actually useless for your life. They are useless for your unity and they are useless for your conflict. There's no other place to turn for unity, building it and rebuilding it than the word of God. Colossians 2.8, you can write it down. Paul says this, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, which is according to the tradition of men According to the elementary principles of the world, you see, those are all rival words. Let no one take you captive through them. They're not according to Christ. In conflict, rival words will kidnap you from unity, keep you from it. They will not help you to rebuild it. Listen, this church in the early 2000s blew up from the inside out. It blew up. It disintegrated and it integrated philosophies and psychologies that were according to man's traditions and wisdom. How did that work for us? Did you see any of that make us bond together more tightly? You know what it did? It pushed people away. Unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. Rival words only separate. You might like the way they sound. They might taste good in your mouth, but they go down and it's bitter. Lastly, Revelation 22 verses 18 to 19. God knew how to start this book, didn't he? And he's the only one who formed it. Look, this, this wasn't put together by bumbling men who are like, hey, uh, I wonder, do you think we should put James in or not? I don't know. Do you think? No, God formed this book from page one all the way to the end. Did, did, he knew what he was doing at the beginning. There's no doubt about that. Did he know what he was going to say at the end? I bear witness to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the what? What does he all go all the way back to? The tree of life. And from the holy city, which are written in this book. Listen, the integration of rival ideas and rival words does not bring health to your team dynamic. It brings a plague. God didn't overstate and he didn't over exaggerate, exaggerate and run on at the mouth in Genesis one. And he didn't overestimate and over exaggerate and run on at the mouth at the end of his book. Every word is tested and proven necessary for you. Every word is proven sufficient. Here's the bottom line for us as we finish out this series for building unity And for rebuilding team unity when conflict has settled in, God's word is entirely sufficient for you. Entirely sufficient. And rival ideas and words will only introduce further separation to what you're already experiencing. 
to introduce rival words and rival ideas into your conflict will be a self-inflicted wound from which your team may not recover. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love your Bible. We love you for giving it to us. Thank you for a flawless formation of the scriptures. Every word tested, not like, well, I'm not really sure this one's good. Let's test it so we can put it in. No, but proven to be perfect, complete, necessary, sufficient. There's not a wasted word anywhere in this book. And Father, as we labor in our marriages and in our parenting and in our ministry teams, our church planting teams, everywhere in this church and outside this church, Lord, would you please convince us all the more that where there is, where when it's hard to build unity and when it's even harder to have to rebuild unity, would you convince us that there is no other place to turn except to your word? Convince us that it would be foolish to introduce us a self-inflicted wound to our conflict by adding other ideas, ideologies, philosophies, worldviews, psychology. You gave us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. You gave us everything we need pertaining to unity and conflict. And we believe you. You have not overstated that. You are not exaggerating. Help us to take you at your word. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.